Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, uh, I just thought I would show you some, um, introduce um, a little bit of why I'm, I'm, I'm here. So um, as mentioned, I was at the University of Auckland and did a lot of work with laser ultrafast spectroscopy and then did some microfluidic stuff. Um, and then went into my PhD to look at the formation of, um, of carbon materials in the gas phase. Uh, which I'll talk about today. Uh, I then went to Singapore and worked um, in a Cambridge University Research Centre looking at how we can um, decarbonise heavy industry, which was interesting and mildly depressing. Um, and then I, uh, I've, I've come to, uh, to Australia on a Forest Fellowship at Curtin University, and uh, that's a three-year fellowship to do whatever I want. So um, I am based in the hydrogen storage research group and the carbon group at um, in the physics department. And um, the, why I'm here in Sydney this week is that next week I am doing a, a media residency with the ABC um, where I will be discussing how carbon materials can help fix the climate. So that is um, that's what I'm here to do. And um, just to give you a, a graphic for the goal or the, the, the plan ahead, um, where I, I'm looking at all these different carbon materials and how they are important in batteries and storing hydrogen, supercapacitors, hydrogen fuel cells, um, production of hydrogen from uh, methane, and then also protecting steel from embrittlement. Um, and I'll be talking specifically in this talk about um, carbon black, and then the disordered carbons, and then the ordered carbons. And I'd like to discuss kind of an idea um, which we've been working on, which is this idea of a computational microscope. Um, and so the idea here is that, um, you know, what, what is a computational microscope? How, how I've kind of been thinking about this is something that allows us to solve problems that are too difficult to imagine. So sometimes when we come to looking at experimental results, sometimes it's, it's hard to actually perceive of how, um, how the mechanism could work. And it's not as easy as just conceiving of something in our head and then going looking for it um, experimentally. And hopefully it will be a bit clearer as I discuss this. So I'll be talking about building a computational microscope for carbon, uh, specifically to do with how we built that for find, looking at how soot forms. And then um, I'll be talking about how we look into or peering into the computational microscope using advanced visualization tools. Because as I'll show you, sometimes it's just impossible to work out um, just by looking at, at the structures generated, what's going on. So let's start off with um, soot or carbon black formation. So, um, so this is something we want to, to reduce the um, emission of because it's bad for the planet. It's the third biggest contributor to climate change after CO2 and methane. It also harms our lungs and makes us more susceptible to respiratory viruses. It's not good. Um, but it's also a, a potential, well, it's, it's necessary for us to help fix the climate. Um, we need carbon blacks for batteries. We also need, um, uh, also people are looking at creating hydrogen directly through the production of carbon blacks um, as a byproduct, which is quite, um, quite nice. Um, so we'd, we'd really like to understand how to improve the conversion of methane. So make lots of soot and then generate hydrogen as the, as the byproduct. And through a review paper that we wrote um, in Progress in Energy Combustion Science, we basically looked at reviewing all of the experimental data to date. And I had quite a bit of experience working with mass spectrometry and electron uh, microscopy before. And so um, looking at the, at the results there and figuring out you know, uh, where we're at. And this here is a schematic that I drew looking at the um, progression of fuels as they break down into small unsaturated aliphatics, cyclizing into benzene and other um, ring structures, and then growing through addition of acetylene into these large um, structures. And I just want to highlight these because these are, are quite stunning. So these are pictures of the molecules from within a flame. These were directly imaged using a non-contact atomic force microscope at IBM. And it really, it really um, I'll talk a little bit about how that had opened up quite a few new insights. 
But really the problem is, is that the, the process by which the molecules cluster to form particles is not understood. We don't have a predictive or general model for how soot inception works, which is this process here. So the first thing that I did is uh, after reviewing all the literature, I wanted to build some sort of computational microscope to, to understand aromatic reactivity because um, basically as, as much uh, variety there is in aromatic chemistry, it has been suggested to form such. <laughs> so, so the idea here was, well, what if we can, um, what if we can actually screen them uh, using some sort of um, approach? And so it took a little while to benchmark something of high enough accuracy to actually um, provide, you know, kind of chemically accurate uh, uh, energies. But we we're able to look at all these different reactive, reactive species and how, what bond energy they form with each other. And uh, the nice thing about this is that anything below about 40 kilocals per mole in terms of energy is going to dissociate in the flame. It's not going to, it's not going to be stable. So that immediately ruled out all of the ones that are not green. So all of these um, are unable to even form something stable in the flame. And most mechanisms today focus on um, sigma radicals, which occur from a hydrogen being abstracted from the edge. And yes, these are stable um, in the flame. Um, and it also, we also discovered some really interesting pi radicals that I'll talk about, which are, are kind of new uh, reactive sites. But uh, before I do that, I just want to say that even, even in light of some new interesting things, we we're also able to compute the kinetics um, of all of these reactions. So the combustion community is very good at computing the rates between things, and they can do that to within you know, a factor of two or three, which is pretty good. Uh, and I found that uh, all the reactions pr pr proposed to date are too slow to explain the sort of reaction. So that's kind of nice. It's a negative result, so that was a bit sad for me, but, um, <laughs> but it's good to rule things out because otherwise people keep exploring them and they are, uh, these are in fact dead ends. But, you know, we kind of found some, some of these interesting bonds here between um, uh, these radicals. So, so I, I worked with IBM to try and see if we could prove that uh, we did in fact have some localized uh, pi radicals. So, and what we did there is we used a scanning tunneling microscope and biased the tip and were able to image directly using negative ion resonance spectroscopy the, um, the localized state. And that's for this molecule here. So it's got two hydrogens here and one hydrogen here. And this site, um, if you look at that uh, at the LUMO, it does match a localized state at the edge. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is it can bond, um, it make a bond that's strong enough to withstand the flame temperatures. So usually if you think of a, 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 a pi radical, this here, I'm actually, I'm plotting the spin density. Uh, and uh, you can see it's kind of delocalized around the edge here. But in the case of these, um, these, uh, these specific sites, they are localized to the edge, which is quite surprising. Um, and that means that they form a bond stable enough to exist in the flame, which is nice, uh, unlike these pancake bonds that form, you know, maybe 20 kilocals per mole, so half the energy needed. And as I was sitting, you know, in, in New Zealand being um, cooped up during the pandemic, I, um, I, was, I was doing uh, a figure for the, for the review and I looked at this molecule and I originally drew it with, um, uh, with all of the pi electrons all connected up. And I kind of looked at that and I said, well, it's not very aromatic if I do that. If I, if I actually dissociate those two electrons and form two radicals, then I can actually add an extra classic step, which is a is a metric is one way of trying to figure out aromaticity and um, to my surprise on this very laptop i computed that the triplet energy is lower in energy than the singlet which means that the electrons are unpaired so that was kind of um kind of quite quite fun so this is kind of the second thing we were able to use this is actually um, a higher much higher level of theory because it's a bit harder to do singlets and triplets uh just in um dft um, and yeah, we were able to find that these localized pi radicals enable di radicals. And actually, if you look at the spin density of these and compare it with over here, it's exactly the same. So it is, in fact, the exact same sort of um, localized state. 
So we wanted to see if this also translates into their reactivity, and it does. So if you react two of them together, they form a bond, actually a barrierless bond, which is really cool. So there's no barrier. They just, they just, as soon as they get close together, they just form this bond. And these are actually energies I computed while they look like the exact same, but there is a difference in the nth decimal place. So as you, as you form these bonds, they have the exact same energy. And we're calling this the polymerization of aromatic rim-linked hydrocarbons. And uh, this is exciting because it, it enables chain reactions, which are necessary to, to, to explain kind of the speed at which it forms. And so, but we wanted to go further, you know, we hadn't, we hadn't used enough computational resources. We really wanted to, um, to, to churn through some, some, some hours. So we said, well, how can we build some sort of a computational microscope to describe these molecules actually reacting in the flame? And the way that we decided to do that was a multi-scale approach. So in order to capture dynamics over a longer time scale, and also a longer length scale, you need to kind of couple together different uh, approximations. This isn't uh, too, um, too different from, from what people talk about often. But I just wanted to say that the group that I was in during my PhD spent like a decade carefully putting together these different approximations. So I think it spent about five, five years just working on the intermolecular forces between aromatics, just to make sure that they match all of the experimental condensation data for benzene. So, um, so and you know, and uh, kinetic Monte Carlo and um, stochastic approaches. And I was able to contribute to some of these to do with the reactive force fields and also accelerated MD. So what we did is we brought together the force field stuff that had been developed. Um, over the over decade. And then we brought together that quantum mechanics that I just benchmarked. And by putting those together, so just the reactive site was modeled with quantum mechanics and then the rest of the molecule was with a normal force field. We we're able to collide these two molecules together under flame conditions uh, and see them reacting. So you can see here, this is one of, I think we ran about 2000 collisions between these molecules. And this is one of them that um, it took about three months to run all of them. <laughs> so it's a very time consuming thing. And you can see the bond forming, which is very nice. Um, but you might have seen something else is that they actually interact with each other a lot before the bond forms. And that's kind of really critical. So we found for all of the reactions between these two sites, they actually form these um, stacked states, these internal rotors. And these rotate relative to one another. And then they, and this allows those reactive sites multiple opportunities to react. And so this actually has the, the, the forward rate constant necessary to explain soot formation. Now it hasn't yet been experimentally verified, um, but um, that's where we're at at the moment. So yeah, that's just a summary there. Um, it's, so there's a review paper if you're interested, and we also um, wrote a paper and, and Jacks that um, covers um, the mechanism. Uh, and at the moment, we're looking at whether we can use ozone to target those reactive sites, and also um, working with some companies that do methane pyrolysis to work out how we can make more carbon and hydrogen out of methane. So that's the first thing, um, new mechanism for soot formation using a multi-scale model. But now I'm going to go into some models that have been generated that are too difficult to understand just by looking at them. So, and this is where the advanced visualization comes in. So what are these glassy and porous carbons? So they are disordered carbons and they are the industrial workhorse of carbon materials. So glassy carbons are materials that are often used in crucibles, fuel cells, electrochemical cells, um, sodium ion batteries, heat shields. I think the um, Parker solar probe hurtling towards the sun has a beautiful uh, glassy carbon shield to protect it from the blistering temperatures of the sun. And if you oxidize a char or a glassy carbon and you heat it up to 900 degrees Celsius, it restructures into a foam, into a porous material. And this is quite bizarre because on this side, this is basically impervious to any chemicals. And on this side, it is one, it's a very, very porous and interconnected structure. So 
Um, and, you know, I've spent many hours looking at these electron micrographs and just thinking what on earth is going on, because that is just a nightmare to try and interpret. Um, and, and I'm really interested in the activated carbons for hydrogen storage. So that's um, one of the applications. Cool it down to liquid nitrogen temperatures and hydrogen will stick to the surface of it. So, um, so I, I, I kind of, I saw a talk from Nigel Marks at the Carbon Conference in 2019. And Nigel actually did his, 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 um, his PhD here um, under, uh, under Professor McKenzie. So, um, and, and developed along, uh, also with uh, a Paranello, um, a beautiful force field for carbon. And, um, and this actually allows for, uh, and, and it's been benchmarked and extensively compared to experiments. And it allows for carbon materials to be self-assembled that actually match experiments. So this is just carbon atoms randomly arranged. And if you so do the molecular dynamics and you see the bonds form and break, you can see what appears to be something that's very close to what you get in the, in the glassy carbon case. And if you do this, this again, but a slightly um, larger box at a lower density, you get a porous carbon. And if you simulate the, the electron micrographs, they look exactly like what you see in the, um, in the experiments and they match in, in, in a lot of other aspects. And for those carbon scientists that really appreciate XRD, the thing that got me very excited about this force field is that it was the first one that could actually get the 002 peak or the reflection. And that was, that was kind of, I find that like a bare minimum. If, if your force field's not able to reproduce that, then, I mean, it's, um, and, and none of them to date had been able to do that, which is a bit depressing. Um, but, you know, that is a nightmare to interpret. <laughs> Just, you know, and I spent many hours um, going through this. So this is actually the website carbonpotentials.com and you can download the structure and you could look at it and it's just very hard to interpret. It's actually a periodic simulation. So the box you see are not edges, it's actually connected across the periodic boundary, which is which really is difficult to think about. Um, and it's just very hard to, to, to look at. So I, what I did is I thought, it, wouldn't it be uh, interesting if I could hold it in my hand? What if I could 3D print it? So the first thing I did is I got the carbon network and I and I turned it into a triangular mesh and I put a vertex at the center of each ring and then I connected it all up into a triangular mesh. And so that's the network and then there's the mesh. And you can see the mesh here um, that I've, I've, um, I've drawn and this is in a 3D printing software. Um, and then I just thickened it using a 3D printing software um, so that I could print it. So here is what it looks like. I used a, a, a fused deposition modeling printer, which I like to call a glorified glue gun. Um, and, and it's able to put down the layers, but also supporting material. And, um, and you can crack that off and you're left with the materials. And so this is the sort of materials you're left with here. And um, I'm just showing you all, I can pass it around as well. Um, yeah, some of the car materials. So um, yeah. There you go. Have a look at those. All right, and then down. <laughs> so yeah, these are the carbon um, materials we 3D printed. So I've got one porous one, that's 0.5 grams per cc, another one which is 1.5 gram per cc, and then something in the middle. So one's a glassy carbon model, another's a porous carbon model. Um, so that was that was quite fun. And it's quite clear that there is this kind of interesting curvature associated with it. So we colored the rings according to whether they are um, five or seven membered rings. And this allowed us to actually um, see what that curvature is due to. And it's actually due to, um, uh, so the, you get bowl shaped regions from pentagons and you get saddle shaped regions from, um, from heptagons. Uh, and one of the things we tried to do first is we thought, oh, let's just count them up. You know, if you've got a fullerene, you've got 12 pentagons. And if we've got, a, if we've got something that's not a fullerene, then it will have a different ratio of heptagons to pentagons. But the problem is, and you might be able to see this, this is at, in fact an edge. And these are non-hexagonal rings at an edge, which are not contributing to the global curvature. So if you count up the five and seven membered rings, you get nonsense, because there's a whole bunch of rings that are just at the edges. 
So again, we turn back to that graph representation that I had, and we realize that actually this is a, a and I use the 3D printing software, you can actually compute the curvature on that surface, um, which is what I did here. So if it's flat, then the angles around each vertex are two pi, and if it's bowl shaped, it's less than two pi, and if it's saddle shaped, it's more than two pi. And we found that all of the structures, both the, set, both the porous and the glassy carbon, all have a saddle shape or a net negative Gaussian curvature if you love your topology like me. So that's the first thing. The second thing we could do is we could actually look for edges. So this is a way of doing this in a, in a 3D printing software. You can actually just look for edges inside of it and you get all sorts of wonderful structures. The thing that I got most excited about is in the higher density structures, you actually see lots and lots of screws. So the edges wind up like a spiral staircase. Um, and uh, it's actually very hard to see this. I mean, this is, this is I, I'm repeating that a lot, but it's, it's very hard to, to visualize these things. I combine that with uh, plotting the non-SP2 carbon atoms. And that allowed us to find some new sort of structures. So the first one is a YT junction. A sheet just terminates on the end of another sheet. Um, we also have buckled edges. We have crosshatch ribbons where they kind of crosshatch like that. We still haven't figured out what, what, how that really works. And then we have screws, and we have lots of screws. Screw dislocations, these screws that wind the layers up. And that kind of resolved a lot of issues. So both these structures have got a saddle-like or saddle shape. That's their global curvature. And the layered structure is layered because it's screwed together. And that enables it to be connected and curving while also stacking and giving you those graphitic reflections. So that, that was, um, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. So yeah, and there's the paper if you're interested in reading about that, um, the, the topology of distorted 3D graphene networks. Um, yeah, and I just think they're quite beautiful. Um, so this is a rendering of the curvature, the color is the curvature. So yeah, just wonderful structures. We're currently working on, on, on seeing where hydrogen goes inside. I have a student that's doing grand canonical Monte Carlo simulations that I can't show yet, but, but we'll, and we're also doing some stuff with adding oxygen to see how oxygen and hydrogen uh, influence it. So I'll whiz through the last little bit because I think that's quite fun. Um, I still have some time. So yeah, so 3D printing in the case of the glassy porous carbons allowed us to discover a potential and a structure for disordered carbons. We're still working on um, showing how, how it matches up. All right, so graphite formation. So we thought, oh, disordered carbons are a nightmare. Surely graphite formation is well understood, right? No, no, not well understood at all. And so Jason Fogg, a, a, a PhD student and the carbon group um, working with Rene Suarez Martinez spent a lot of time trying to figure this one out. So uh, if you have a disordered carbon, when you cook it to 1000 degrees, you get this. And if you cook a, a graphitizing carbon, you get this more layered aligned structure. And if you cook that to incredible temperatures, 2500 degrees Celsius, you get graphite. So why does it take such high temperatures? Why do you have to cook the living daylight lights out? You know, um, uh, because, and one of the big problems here is if we're going to, uh, turn everyone into, you know, run, run around with electric cars, we're going to need lots of graphite. And we preferably would like to synthesize it, um, then mine it, because you have to do acid drainage, acid cleaning for the, the mined graphite, which is obviously not very environmentally friendly. So, so we actually worked with an Australian company um, to modify an atomic absorption spectrometer which has a graphite furnace in it. And this is wonderful because it can heat up a sample. This is a little um, animation here. Let's see if I can get that going. Um, and that shows you that within a couple of seconds, we can heat up that to half the surface temperature of the sun, 3000 degrees Celsius. So, which is really impressive. And you can see it's just this tiny little tube, little graphite tube. And if you heat it up to 3000 degrees for too long, the tube actually melts. So we're at the melting point of, of, of graphite, which is extraordinary. And it's this tiny little, you know, this tiny little device. Anyway, it's very cool. And by 
by pulsing it multiple times, we can actually do a stop frame motion video, basically of what's happening to the graphite as it forms. So after one pulse, we look at it in the electron microscope after it's cooled down, then we pulse it again, then we look at it and we do it for multiple pulses. And, oh, such great pictures. So um, new electron microscope, which I love, uh, cold uh, field emission gun. So uh, yeah, it's great. And uh, for the first time, I could actually see carbon atoms. So these are actually, these dots are carbon atoms, which is pretty cool. Um, but we also found um, these ramps between the layers. And if you simulate a screw dislocation, it matches up. So I was actually looking for the screws in the glassy carbon to confirm whether there were screws in it. And uh, it, it just proved too difficult. So I thought, oh, I'll look for the screws in the graphitizing carbon. Surely that would be a bit easier. And sure enough, the first picture I took was that one. So um, yeah, you see these beautiful screws. All right, so, um, right. So again, we want to develop some sort of understanding about this, and we're gonna use that computational microscope approach. In the case of those uh, graphitizing carbons, I told you it starts off from an aligned phase, that's your liquid crystal, mesophase, if that means anything to you, and we cook that. So um, yeah, in the computer, and what self-assembles is an aligned um, bit of graphite which is pretty cool. All right, but again, nightmare. How do we, what on earth's going on now? And it's changing in time, so that's very hard. So what I actually did is I had to play with a virtual reality headset. And I was hoping to bring that today, but, um, uh, but Facebook has decided to suspend my account because of a conflict between my Meta account and Facebook. So, um, so unfortunately I can't um, put it on your head. But um, I can at least show you what, what it feels like here. So this is actually that same model. And I can just pick it up in the virtual reality headset. And I can just uh, zoom in. And I can head right into the center of the structure. And uh, you can see a screw, hopefully. <laughs> a screw dislocation running through the core of it, which is great. So. So that was great. We also did um, some visualization in a big 3D, 180 degree display. And uh, it was only at this point did Nigel believe that there were in fact screws in the, in the simulation because he, he couldn't see it um, uh, until we kind of, um, you know, went inside the material and, and could visualize it. Uh, once, we once we could find out where the screw was, it was quite easy to actually create a figure that could show you where it was. Um, so this is a, a plot. You can see the screw forming. Uh, we increased the temperature of the simulation and we could see the screws being removed. So this, I want you to focus in the highlighted region. This bit here is going to be removed. So that, that little bit there is going to be removed. So let's see if that works. Mm. Here we go. There we go. So you can see here, it's actually going to start. So that's the first layer has been released. And this is still in a screw configuration, this bit here. And at some point, that is going to dissociate. There we go. That's the next one that's dissociated. And then we've got this one here. And that's the last one to go. And that's basically half of the simulation is now graphite or, or unconnected atoms. So what's going on? Well, we actually have what's called a dislocation loop. So we have a screw dislocation here, goes across an edge dislocation, goes down a screw, comes across an edge. And it's quite a nice connection here because uh, Irene Suarez Martinez did her PhD with Malcolm Heggie and um, it was all on screws. So Rene, when I showed her the pictures of the screws, she was very happy and she showed me her thesis where she drew these beautiful pictures of screw dislocation. So that was nice. So what happens is that edge actually um, uh, collapses down. So it actually, the, the screw core doesn't move. It's actually the um, edge that will attack the atom within the screw. A kink will form and it will run across and then you'll get a glide. So it will reduce in height by one layer. 
and it keeps going until there's just two layers and then when the kink forms it annihilates the um, dislocation loop. We also tracked the graphenic regions, these are the regions of hexagonal alignment as the simulation went along, so you can see here um, how, we, how we dissociated them just with a, a simple graph representation. And as the screws went away, the graphenic crystallites increased. Now this is the hardcore kind of XRD, so yeah, let's enjoy this. So um, that peak gives you the graphenic crystallites and that peak gives you the layered stacking structure. And you can see that it's only during the graphitization transition that the graphenic crystallites start to grow. So that's kind of promising. Um, and we also see that the interlayer spacing reduces and it turns out that those screws um, are only possible in AA or ABC stack graphite. So they actually inhibit ABA stacking of the null graphite. Um, and finally, I just wanted to show you what happens when we pulse it, because I said that we can do pulsing, right? So if we pulse it, we see the D002 decreases, the uh, LA increases, but the LC does not change, which is a really nice result. It's actually the first experiment that shows one, yeah, that the LC does not change in time as the LA and the interlayer spacing decreases. So it's very clear that Whatever's growing in that LA is also reducing the interlayer spacing. So that's if you really enjoy XRD. So we think that what's called the annealable topological defects is a screw dislocation, um, and it's removed by this edge dislocation uh, approach. And that um, the non-annealable topological defects, so these are the things that can't get out of non-graphitizing carbons. Well, the nice thing is we've got a model of non-graphitizing carbon. So what's the difference between the two, right? Because this, there's actually, when you look at them, there's not too much difference in the sense that they both have non-hexagonal rings in them. Uh, but of course, this one is aligned while as this one is not. And the difference, so the difference isn't non-hexagonal rings, it's the presence of what's called a disclination. And that's a region that's a non-developable or a non-flattened, you can't flatten it, um, piece of graphene. Turns out that the non-graphitizing carbons have got these saddle-shaped structures in it, which um, are very hard to get rid of. You actually have to um, climb it out. So it's, it's hard to get rid of that defect. So anyway, so that's kind of the last thing. So um, yeah, so the last thing I showed you here was observing graphite um, form using these virtual reality headsets. Um, where to next? About three more minutes. Yes, three more minutes. So where to next? So we've now just got a million, a million atom carbon structure. So there are a million carbon atoms in the simulation. And you thought that the, la the, the last structures I showed you had 32,000. So this is an absolute nightmare. So you kind of like, where am I? What on earth is going on? Very, very confusing. Um, so I have this very um, great student that is working on a virtual reality software that can actually get you inside the structure. And, and we've recently been um, accepted into an exhibition in a science gallery in Bengaluru to exhibit this in a um, projected dome. So like a planetarium dome is going to be projected inside of there. And the way that this works is as you walk around um, inside the virtual reality headset, it generates only the regions near you. So you can see that you're, you're not plotting a, a million carbon atoms, you're only plotting about 10,000 carbon atoms. And uh, when you look inside, this is kind of what you see. So I like to think of it as like caving. You know, it kind of looks like you're caving. Um, and, uh, and you can see here, this is where you're looking. This is the simulation box. And the wonderful thing about this is as you move forward, it'll auto-generate across the periodic boundary. So you keep going. And as you zoom through this, oh, I've just popped into the other side of the simulation box. But as you see, it's continuous. It's a very hard thing to I, I, teach, um, I teach molecular simulation. It's very hard to explain the periodic boundary condition. But I find this is quite useful because you literally go left and you eventually, and you just kind of end up on the other side of the box. So that's what we're doing here. If I go left, I go through here and then I pop out on the other side. 
And you see, I, there's no edges. It's just connected continuously. So hopefully that's, um, that's going to be a bit of fun uh, to try. The, I find that the porous carbons are awesome. It's kind of like you're in an enormous cavern, you know, down in Margaret River. Um, one of those big caving experiences. So anyway, this one only works on a very high power um, computer. <laughs> so um, yeah, this one's quite, quite difficult to get working. Hmm. So um, yeah, I've shown you how some carbon materials can fix the climate and how these advanced visualization tools can be used to, to achieve that. Um, I'm happy to talk afterwards and show you some more of the 3D printing stuff. Um, unfortunately, I can't demo the VR headset because um, Facebook had other, other ideas today. But um, thank you very much for your, um, uh, for your attention. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank funding agencies and um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Yeah, Sam, Sam Jacob, uh, is from the Green Park. Uh, any uh, questions from our audience in the room or online?